And so initially, some of the reaction was rejection. Oh, it's contamination. You know, those mm -hmm. are, that's oh. not really dinosaur. It's microscopic artifact. Mm -hmm. It's bacteria, because bacteria can look kind of strange sometimes. So you had a lot of proposals of what it could be. And to her credit, Dr. Schweitzer did more work, which mm -hmm. is what science is. She did more analytical work, dug deeper. They began to find protein. You break open some of these cells. You look in the, at the matrix these cells are attached to, and they're protein. Particularly, one of the common proteins they found is called collagen. Now, collagen is the most common protein in any vertebrate. Vertebrate meaning those animals that have spinal columns. Collagen is the most dominant protein. It's a hearty protein. But there was no reason based on any kind of biochemistry known about collagen, any kind of biochemistry of how collagen degrades. There was no reason to think that collagen could naturally easily survive mm -hmm. for 65, 70 million years. And all of that research, did it lead towards the conclusion that it's not bacteria, it's not something that It uh, very much it? did, right. That you can dismiss the bacteria idea, you can dismiss the contamination idea, it is real dinosaur tissue, real dinosaur cells, and real dinosaur protein. Okay, so once that is uh, understood, yes. then what happens? Now this is shaking it up, I guess. That becomes part of the controversy because clearly you're now faced with how could you explain the survival of this, the pristine survival mm. of this, not only for so long, but in very unpristine conditions. There's nothing pristine about Hell Creek, Montana, for example. It, it's not permafrost. It's not like these were in a deep freeze for millions of years. Like we mentioned before, the temperature fluctuations, water, you know, what water will degrade proteins. When we pulled the horn out of the ground, it had water underneath it just from the seepage of rainwater. That's why when we first dug the horn out, we thought, oh, there's nothing gonna be in there. And there was. So these are not dry, they're not sealed in some kind of, you know, stainless steel vault. They're subjected to all kinds of conditions that would degrade this oh. stuff. And so then the controversy has been, how do you explain it? Mm -hmm. And if you read some of the literature, there's almost like desperation of, would you guys please explain this? Because they recognized what the implications of this could be. Now, some people would claim, well, it means nothing because we know how old they are and therefore it just means it survives somehow, big deal. But how do you know how old they are? Well, you use methods, supposed methods of dating. Well, this is a method of dating. The tissue itself can't be discounted as part of a method of dating. So why do you say that doesn't count, but this does count? Well, it's all the paradigm drives your conclusions. The paradigm is it has to be old, therefore methods that give us an old fossil are what we choose. Something that doesn't give us an old fossil like tissue, we have to reject or explain away. Mm -hmm. And the big push at the moment is to explain it away, to come up with some explanation of how the tissue survived. There are several ideas out there. The most popular one at the moment is the one that Mary Schweitzer herself has proposed, where she proposed that in red blood cells, you have hemoglobin, which of course is composed of iron, which is what then attracts and binds the oxygen, so that the hemoglobin in the red blood cell can transport the oxygen around in the body. Okay, what she's proposed is that upon the death of the animal, the red blood cells ruptured and they released the hemoglobin, which released the iron. In biological systems, iron can catalyze what's called a Fenton reaction. And this reaction, in essence, just causes proteins, for example, to cross-link. So it causes reactions of the proteins so that they actually become more resistant. So in this cross-link state, microbes don't degrade them as fast, enzymes don't degrade them as fast, so they just simply don't compose as fast. And so she's proposed that that then explains how they could have lasted millions of years. We reject what she's at least proposed so far because we would say, first off, Fenton reactions are also going to leave signatures. They're going to leave signatures in how they're going to change the chemical state of certain amino acids. And in the protein analysis that's been done of like the collagen, for example, 
those amino acids in that protein don't have that altered chemical state that you would expect from a Fenton reaction. Mm -hmm. See, so we're not seeing the footprints that we would expect to see if these reactions were actually causing these massive changes to the proteins that were causing them to be preserved better. We would also say that the models themselves that have been studied take some of this into account. You know, the collagen models, they take into account some of the physical changes that are going to occur to collagen that you would say may make it more resistant to degradation. And yet the studies show that it still doesn't last tens of millions of years. So there is no physical chemical evidence that's going to support the idea that proteins, any protein, is going to be able to last tens of millions of years. It's just strictly an extrapolation. It must last because we know these are old. And there becomes your conundrum. Again, the paradigm driving the conclusion. We also would challenge that the study that Dr. Schweitzer did, she used ostrich blood vessels. And she soaked them in water, soaked them in solutions of of, of iron from hemoglobin, soaked them in various solutions, and then monitored their degradation, how fast they degrade. And she reported that after two years, those that were exposed to, her, to the iron were, for the most part, undegraded. <laughs> but first, two years at a steady temperature doesn't extrapolate to 65 million years at an unstated temperature. Second, any technician can tell you that we take great pains in laboratories to preserve cells, to preserve protein, to preserve tissue. We freeze it. We deep freeze it. We freeze it, you know, minus 200 degrees in liquid nitrogen. You don't leave it out. You don't expose it to water. You don't expose it to all the things that, in all honesty, these fossils tended to be exposed to because everybody knows that accelerates degradation. So in, in the normal sense, uh, even uh, someone who holds to a very uh, recent creation, uh, that would lead you to believe that this shouldn't be here either, right? Because even for uh, several thousands of years, you wouldn't expect it. It certainly would not be your first prediction. Even from a creationist position, we know full well that these fossils are exposed to ground level radiation. In fact, you can take almost any dinosaur fossil and put a Geiger counter against it and it'll light it up because huh. they've absorbed radiation. So even for 4,000 years, we say, wow, that's still quite a challenge to think they'd absorb radiation and still... So how are you going to explain 65 million years of exposure to this radiation? And Dr. Schweitzer's iron preservation model doesn't account for that. So as a microbiologist, uh, when you look at this, uh, the two major paradigms that we have before us, and uh, even though this is surprising, there is a paradigm uh, between these right. two right. that better fits the evidence Absolutely. than the other. I think we understand enough about the process and enough about tissue itself to recognize that the more clear, parsimonious, if you will, the, 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 the simplest explanation is simply that the fossils aren't as old as they're being claimed to be. And so that clearly, this is in violation of the dating process. It challenges the entire dating process. If the fossils of dinosaurs have been dated incorrectly, which I would say this is clear evidence they have, then it's very likely the fossils of any organism been dated incorrectly, and therefore then the geologic ages themselves are incorrect. And we have to go back and recognize that they use evolution as their control, if you will. It's the filter. If I don't get a date that fits what evolution expects, then the date is rejected. It doesn't make a difference what the date is. It doesn't make a difference how you came about getting the date if it doesn't fit the filter of evolution, if it doesn't fit what we need. If you have something that's out of the Jurassic, but it's dated at 300 million years, that can't be right. Therefore, it's automatically tossed out. Why can't it be right? Because we have, in the evolutionary assumptions, determined that organisms that lived during the period of the Jurassic are this old. Hmm. And so it sets then the interpretation for everything. Hmm. When you have problems like the soft tissue, see, you either have to re reject the entire dating process or you have to reject the soft tissue. You know, you really can't have both. They're trying to have both, 
but it clearly is one or the other. You know, either the fossils aren't as old as we think they are, or there's some mysterious, unknown, magical process that preserves them. Well, which is more scientific? What we know today, the tissue can't last that long, therefore the fossils can't be that old, regardless of what other dating methods you claim you've used.